Good morning to everybody that is not a Chiefs fan. We are filming this on Friday, January 31st. But if you're watching this, it is the day after the Super Bowl. And I'm going to go out on a limb here and assume that the Chiefs won the Super Bowl. So you're happy. You don't get a good morning. However, you do get some premium content today. We are diving back in. This is the first episode. This is Behind the Business of Fantasy Football, where we are looking at everything social, branding, marketing, business in the fantasy football industry. Now, this is our first two-time guest, Andy Holloway of the Fantasy Footballers. He was the first ever guest I had on for this series two years ago. That was back when he and the uh, Fantasy Footballers were, were mere mortals. And since then, Things have uh, <laughs> been very, very successful in this space, of course. Brought him back on because we have, I, I've been fortunate enough to meet Andy in person a few times over the last couple of years. We've always clicked since the first interview we had a few years ago. They've obviously grown tremendously, both from a number standpoint and uh, just as people and, and the brand and everything about what they're doing is, is what I admire in the space today. So I love what they're doing over there. Andy, welcome back. I'm, I'm really looking forward to the conversation today. Uh, I, I am as well, and uh, appreciate you having me on. I will say that it's, it seems shocking to me that that was somehow two years ago. If that's true, that surprises me. Time has kind of flown by uh, for, for us over here, and I'm looking forward to the conversation. It's always fun for me to – I enjoy stepping outside of the uh, football questions into the, the entrepreneurship and business and branding and all of those discussions, and they're, they're a lot of fun for me, so I'm, I'm looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, I think that's why I love having you on for discussions like this, because I know, like, I, I could tell right away uh, when we first kind of connected that you you had that mindset um, and you like to look at things beyond just the the content that people are putting out in the fantasy football space. And I think that's why we clicked and that's why we've kind of maintained the relationship over the years. And like I said, you guys have have grown tremendously. And in today's talk uh, for the audience that are, that are new to the series, this will have nothing to do with fantasy football from a player analysis standpoint. And and games and analysis, that kind of stuff. This is all bigger picture things relating to um, their brand. So speaking of like the fantasy footballers, you guys have obviously grown um, tremendously over the last couple of years. You know, you won the iHeart Radio Sports Podcast Award last year. You were uh, a nominee again this year. And when I'm looking at the list of people, you know, you guys are the only one that were an independent podcast on the list. There were a lot of powerhouses there. You guys basically ran the show at the FSGA this year, took home, I think it was like five separate awards. That includes maybe Mike's individual award. From a personal standpoint, you guys gaining this sort of popularity uh, through social media and just success through the business. I'm curious as to how it's rolled over and affected your personal life. Like, do you have people coming up to you uh, in public and recognizing you and and what is it like as you've seen yourself as a person and as the company has grown you know how has that impacted your personal life yeah I, you know it's um it's a good question and it's something that I probably don't sit back and think about too often but I mean we have people come up from time to time uh, it's always fun you know with we're out here in, in Phoenix, so we do the, you know, the Disney trips or the, uh, you know, amusement parks, and that's where we run into it more often. Mm -hmm. Or if I'm walking around with, uh, you know, Mike, Mike is a pretty recognizable individual. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, here and there, we'll find people that uh, are fans of the show. It's always fun to interact with the, with the listeners and, and, and chat, but, um, you know, it's not, it's not that often. As far as the personal life, it's been a wild ride. Uh, it, it's one of those things where you kind of, find yourself thinking, you know, you're, you're certainly thankful that the company has grown. I mean, you set out with a goal to build a business and to build a company and to provide for your employees, something that I get a lot of um, just uh, satisfaction out of. Like, that's something that I, I really enjoy seeing their careers develop uh, in terms of like our producers and our staff. When I, when I look back, it, it's just funny because we were talking about this at lunch the other day you you kind of you simultaneously are super thankful for growth and you and you also now that we've been doing this for five years you do romanticize a little bit of the early days as well so we find ourselves looking at like you don't want to go back in a lot of ways to the beginning right um like financially we're 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 better off now than we were then um you know we have a studio and we have staff and we don't have as many responsibilities from a day-to-day -day admin perspective and those type of things. Um, but, but you're at the point now where, you know, five years in, we do romanticize some of the days of being in the upper, you know, in my, one of my extra bedrooms, mm -hmm. 
having to install an extra air conditioner, uh, Jason living his, you know, eight hours of his day in a closet, a walk-in closet with a desk. Um, you know, you look back fondly at that. And you also, I think, recognize that, you know, you try to keep the same types of mindsets that you had back then. I think that's really important to us. Um, we have that moniker of remember why you do this and remember how you got here. Those two things are like in my head every single day. Uh, but you, you simply can't fully replicate the way you were in the beginning from a mindset perspective. You, it's just an impossibility to say, hey, be the year one startup in year five. So you learn how to adjust a little bit on a, on a personal level. I think we've learned some things about schedule making and about, you know, trying not, I, I'm very conscious of trying not to bite off too many commitments and uh, do too much. But at the same time, I think last year with the tour and some of the things we did, we learned that you need a little bit of margin for things to pop up. I think that's what we ran into a little bit was like, we had a pack schedule and then, you know, we get invited to be part of league one with the NFL or we get invited to be part of uh, the sleeper bowl with Juju and Ninja. And those, those are cool opportunities, but um, you know, this year we're going to try to leave a little bit more margin so that we can be fully excited about taking advantage of things that crop up. But I mean, I think we're all very, very conscious of we're, we're all dads and we all want to make sure that this business is serving us and our employees and not, the other way around, so to speak. So, uh, you know, it, it's changed a lot over the last five years and it's, it's good to look back and it's good to kind of take inventory once a year, but, um, yeah, it's been a kind of a crazy ride. So let me follow up to you talking about pulling back on some things. You left me tickets for the show that you did in New York last summer. And I imagine, you know, the physical traveling is something that, uh, zaps a lot of time, but more importantly, energy from you guys like you might be traveling to a place for one day but that might take away from the day before as well as the day after as well as you know the in-between hours and the hours add up from that kind of stuff so when you have opportunities like you guys have right being uh being able to get into a league with like juju and zach efron and, and cat and things like that like that's an opportunity that even when you're sucked out of energy you're probably not going to say no to so you saying you've learned from those experiences where you know you need to pull back like, where is the line that you walk uh, to give yourself margin? Like, do you start pulling back from those physical shows? Um, like, give us like tangible examples of, of this sure. upcoming year. Where do you pull back on? Yeah, I know I'll, I'll, uh, I'll disclose something that we haven't really even talked about with the Foot Clan yet, which is, you know, we, we've had these tours the past two years and they're, you know, you spoke to it. They're very, very fun. And we love doing them. We love interacting with, the fans there is nothing like the one-to-one -one interaction at any of these events that we do the live podcast uh, but you're right there is more to it than showing up on you know the night we do the live event right there is shipping your staff across the country there is the planning that goes into it uh, there is the promotional capital and what i mean by that is we spend time on our show. We have, a, we have a finite amount of time on the podcast to promote something, a product we sell. It could be advertisers that fill spots. It could be those type of things. And so you allot a large amount of promotional capital around a tour where you're propping it up and telling people to get out and come see you. And um, all of that is great. I mean, there's nothing wrong with it inherently. We loved it. But you look at that whole scope and you say, well, one tour date equals you know, three weeks of planning, large capital investment, you, you kind of look at the whole picture. And the way I think that we draw the line here is the value proposition and the, and the return and saying, you know, it's been several years where, you know, you, we could do a bunch of different things, right? We could spin up five more podcasts or a podcast network. We could branch out into different products or commit resources to you know building out exclusive dynasty or auction content or dive headlong into dfs or sports betting so you you have all these opportunities in front of you and i don't doubt that if we took one of them on or two of them on we would succeed in doing that so you start to reevaluate it more based on what is the best use of our time what what is the greatest effect for the output that we're going to invest either financially or, or with personnel and things like that 
and you try to make the best decision based on that information. So another thing that gets lost in like the touring and travel or taking advantage of press opportunities is like we're creative directors, we're product people here at the, at the company. So when it comes to developing our ultimate draft kit or our app or player profiles or the website, we're gone from that for a duration, right? We've got, we've got a developer here or we've got people working, but we're not here being the creative, you know, juice behind it or pushing the direction. So that's a, that's a sacrifice that you, that you make if you are doing those things. So I think coming into this year, we just simply wanted to say, Hey, we want to stay focused on the product. We want to stay focused on being, leaving enough margin in our lives to be creative. This is a mistake that I think any, anyone could make with opportunities in front of them saying, if it's there, we got to do it. Right. Like, and like you said, you know, the opportunity in, in, in sleeper bowl, we're not really going to pass that up, right. but are you putting yourself in a position where you can take advantage of the things that prop up that pop up, but you also prioritize uh, what makes the greatest effect for your business. So I, I think as a creative person, as a, as a, a person that wants to sit here, I want to have a day where I'm in the office and I'm saying, with a fresh slate, what's the best thing I can do right now for the business? Or what, what creative idea can I have that I didn't have yesterday that's not just lost because I'm running from one show to the next show to the next recording to this travel event to that travel event or those types of things. And that's just kind of the mindset that I'm in as I look at what the next, you know, five or 10 years might be for our business. What do I want it to be? You know, we're in a position fortunately, where we get to decide that for ourselves, you know, what, what do I want to be doing for the next five to 10 years? How do I want to be doing it? So those are things that we, I think we're thinking about heading in, into this year. And that will mean pulling back on live events for this year. Okay. That will mean focusing on making sure that all of our uh, energy and excitement is still remaining in the podcast and making that content great. That's our passion. That's what we love to do. We don't want to put anything in the way of developing great product and and building a great show so you know this it doesn't mean it's indefinite it doesn't mean it's forever but i know this year we'll do uh we'll definitely be doing less live events than last year you're still coming to new york we'll probably end up in new york at some point but i'm not right. sure if we'll do a live event there or not we need to get you into the hq physically we'll see. And do one of these that's right that'd be fun i love new york by the way that that trip every year is is wonderful i, I think like what you touched on there uh, was super important because you, I mean, you guys have so much leverage at this point that like you said, you can choose what you want to do. But I also think like when you're choosing it, there's a, there's a give and a take there. Uh, I think a lot of people would look at your position from the outside and be like, you have to do this because the money's good. But you also like, I think another reason that we connect well is because I, you're a super self-aware person. Um, I think you're able to look at things like super objectively especially on like a personal level, you value different things, right? Like you value your creativity. So on one side of the spectrum, you'll give up money from an opportunity if it means, you know, more mental clarity, more openness, uh, more ability to be creative. Like you said, like you want to walk into the studio one day and kind of have nothing on your slate, but be able to open your mind creatively, even if that means giving up a portion of revenue uh, that you would have gotten from another source had you not given yourself the openness to be creative. And I think that's a really important lesson. Like not everything is a uh, straight up numbers and, and money game when it comes to business. I think you have to start looking at uh, the entire circle of things, um, whether it is, the, you know, the things that you value, creativeness, mental clarity, whatever it is, those are all in the same bucket and you have to give somewhere and you have to take somewhere. And I think that's, that's very important. Not a lot of people that are inside of it realize that. I think you're right. And I think you hit on something at the end that I identify with completely, which is that you have, you got 24 hours in your day, right? And you can only do so many things with all of your um, effort and with excellence. I mean, that's the kind of thing I think about. Now we could make decisions to, you know, staff up to do something else, but that's a decision we've internally, you know, it's not our ambition. Our ambition is not um, our, our view of success the why behind what we do is not purely determined by some sort of financial metric, right? Finance, uh, you know, economics is a part of how we define success, but it's not the entirety of it. 
as is, you know, notoriety or popularity of those things. Those are important for certain goals that we have, but they're not the thing that's going to determine, you know, they're not the rudder on the ship in its entirety. So you kind of have to evaluate, uh, like you said, on the surface, somebody out there is going to perceive decision A, decision B as better than these other ones that I'm talking about of having the creative freedom. Um, somebody's going to say, well, it's much better if you tour. It'd be better if you toured 10 cities, if you did 15 cities, if you did 20. Uh, that means you're having more success. And that's not necessarily how we would view it. It's all about making sure you understand the why behind what you're doing. Otherwise, you're going to have no distilling uh, filter for decision making when lots of opportunities come your way. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we have more leverage now than we used to. But I still think in the first few years of our existence, the best decisions we made were often no decisions that seemed really, really good at the outset or seemed like something that you just couldn't pass up on. You know, those are the types of things that I think are really, really important for uh, budding entrepreneurs or people with vision, creativity that want to build something sustainable uh, to, to keep in mind. Yeah, this is something that I've kind of realized over the last like year or two, when it comes, I'm a big believer in in energy, both like the energy that you could personally give off and the energy that people around you give off. And in a given day, like you said, you only have so much of it. I think people should start looking at it from a full circle thing. Like there's physical energy and there's mental energy, but they're the, they're the same in my mind. Like you only have a certain amount of it to give out in a day. So if you have a lot on your plate, like say you go to the gym for an hour and a half, that is also going to suck out some of the uh, creative energy that you can give out for the day. And I think people need to be more self-aware about that. And it's also very subjective. Like you said, I think that's a reason why you guys have been so successful up to this point is because you can be subjective to what you think success is. Like everyone's going to have a different idea of success. Like you said, someone might be like, oh, you should do 25 cities and that's their idea of success but it's your business. Like you're running it the way that you think uh, success should be. And you guys have obviously navigated that in a great fashion and it's worked well up to this point. I'm sure it'll continue to work for you guys up to the point where if I'm on talking more about like your physical product and your service, you know, you can't go onto the app store. You can't go onto the podcast store and look up anything like NFL fantasy football related and have you guys pop up as the number one name. I think on, on the podcast app, you guys have over like 17,000 five-star reviews. You're the number one podcast on there. 5.0 clean, clean, clean rating. You're kind of running the industry now. And even at the FSGA event, which we were at a couple of weeks ago in Vegas, there's like an, there's an energy around you guys. Like the people in the industry Maybe they didn't take you seriously like two or three years ago. And I don't know if you, you pick up on this personally, but I could see it from an outside source. Like the people within the industry, even like the more popular people kind of want to surround themselves around you guys because you give out, you give off that glow, you give off the, you know, you guys are like up and coming leaders within the industry. And you could just tell that there is this energy around you guys when you're in the sphere of other people in, in the industry. And it's, it's something that I'm curious. Do you notice that when you're at these events and does it get stronger and stronger as the years go by? Well, he said a lot of nice things there, Nick. I will say this, you know, it, it makes me, I feel good hearing that in the context of the fact that I know that part of our mission at this, you know, at the Fantasy Footballers is to be a very inclusive product, an inclusive show, something that I think was underestimated in the space a little bit, just the idea that like accessibility and we call ourselves, you know, a lot of the times the Disney of fantasy football because, you know, we're a family oriented show. So I, I guess in the, in the regard that I wanted to try to take this industry and move it beyond what I would look at as basement dwelling, let's leave the family upstairs. I go downstairs with my buddies and, and sports and football and fantasy. This is my thing that I'm going to do on my own and moving that into something slightly more inclusive and something that you know, can be a complement to life as opposed to simply something that's, you know, amused for one person in a family. Like th those are some things that I think we believed about fantasy before we started the show and comes through our show. You know what you should uh, do? You know what you what should, should do? I do? Since that's such a driving force for you guys, your, your whole family thing, and you instill that into your content and you instill that into what you guys do, you should create a league where it's, you know, you three, and your kids, you, you play against the top influencers in the industry that also have kids. Like you should make a league with 12 
people that have their own podcasts or whatever, each team will be like one of you guys and then one of your kids or all your kids together or something and make it like a family league. Cause that's like a way to, I think a lot of people have the idea of they have a vision or a why and they talk about it, but they don't instill it in like, they don't really live it. You know what I mean? I think that's a, a, a pretty cool way for you guys to do that. If you don't already. Yeah. Do yeah. I mean this, well, I mean, I think your idea of inviting some influencers and, and making it a higher profile thing is exciting. We, I did do like a very impromptu family league right before the season started listeners and their sons. My son got into the league. This was the first time you know, I've been doing this for five years. And this is the first time both my boys who are 11 and eight wanted to play. And the eight year old went hog wild. He wears a Patrick Mahomes shirt every day of the week <laughs> at this point in time. Uh, he won the darn league. So he's got this trophy in his room where he, that he brags to everybody yeah. about. But no, I mean, I think that's really fun. I, I, um, I think we have some other projects that are oriented towards that, that we're, we're thinking about these days. And uh, I just think some of that was undervalued or underrepresented. Um, we, we have always, we used to shock people in the fact that these, you know, 10 or 15 year leagues that we were in, you know, were pride leagues. They weren't money leagues. You know, they were just leagues that almost, they got a life of their own just for bragging rights and staying connected with people. And uh, that, that sense of connection that comes with fantasy is something that I think we put at the, at the very top of the, of the list. So uh, I guess to circle back to the FSGA and the industry and stuff like that, you know, it makes me excited that if other people look at us and say, I want to capture some of that energy or some of that vibe, that's cool for me. I, I don't look at, you know, it's one of the reasons that, you know, I, I really like what you're doing and the fact that we've connected is I don't, I don't look at people coming up in the space as threats to what we're doing. I'm, I'm kind of of the opinion that if you have something cool to say or a product to build and people want to listen to it or they want to buy it, then you know, they're going to buy it. And if they want to listen to what we want to say, if they want to listen to five different people, that's all going to be based on how they evaluate what they want to listen to. So um, we try not to have that kind of competitive mindset in the space. And maybe that comes through a little bit with the FSGA, but you know, I, I'm, I'm thankful that, that we've been able to have that ideal and still succeed in the space. I want to touch on the competitiveness within our industry right now, because it's it's a really really interesting time because our I mean the industry when it when it breaks down to the core the industry is built around content right whether it's video or blogging or podcasting whatever it is and there are so many people creating content right now and a lot of people creating good content the whole industry is built on that when that's the main product or service the people who are making it the the influencers in a sense are the ones who decide which avenue it goes on right now. If you're on Twitter, you're following everyone within the industry pretty much, and you kind of know what's going on and different, you know, there are niches kind of popping up and you're starting to see it more and more as we, as we develop as an industry. It's really interesting. It's why I love this series because there are not a lot of people that look at it the way that you guys look at it, the way that I do. Most people are like just bloggers or writers or podcasters like at heart. And that's what they do. They don't like the um, bigger picture of things. It's an interesting, it's almost like unnavigated territory for where our, in uh, our industry is because I mean, if you look at like the automobile industry, you didn't have like Henry Ford and the people who started it like connecting on a crazy level and everyone is so friendly within our industry. I'm wondering, and I want to hear your thoughts because this is an industry that's growing rapidly and there is tons of opportunity available to people. And by that, I primarily mean money wise. I'm wondering if over the next couple of years, those people who are just bloggers or whatever at heart will start to look at things differently. Because right now everyone is friendly. And like you said, you don't look at other people as competitors, but I think once people start to open their eyes a little bit more to see you know, just how big this industry is becoming, I think we're gonna see a shift in um, that type of competitive nature. Because I don't look at other people as competitors either, but from a business standpoint, like I do wanna win. And you know, I will go against other people if I need to. And, and I think yeah. we're gonna eventually head that, that direction, you know? Yeah. And I, I think it's probably worth the note of saying like, you know, we're obviously driven to compete. Like that's part of it. But from a personality and a connection standpoint, like you said, the majority 
or a large portion of the industry that certainly the people that we connect with on a regular basis um, are not living in this uh, you or me kind of mindset. Uh, we're all trying to be the most successful that we can be. We all have like within the business framework, you know, you've got maybe somebody buys two draft kits a year, but they probably don't buy a hundred. So you're competing on that level right. to, to create a great product and things like that. But, um, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know what's going to take place over the next few years. I know that what it meant to succeed or be validated in fantasy football has changed probably over the last five to 10 years. Yep. I know when we came into the space, writing was certainly supreme. And obviously that's, that's a piece of the content puzzle, but it's not all of it. I mean, I think uh, we've seen a lot of people bring creativity to the content aspect of fantasy football. So the evolution of, of the space, like you said, more money is going to come into it, whether that's simply because of uh, the growth of, you know, for specific industries like podcasting or, you know, mobile devices, apps, th those things, or even just sports betting and the growth of regulated gaming that brings more attention. Those type of things, I think, are going to take place, but I, I don't know what it's going to look like. Yeah, like you said, the success in this industry, what it looked like a few years ago, is not what it's going to look like in a couple of years. And that's why I think there's going to be such a mindset change, because say you had 20,000 followers on Twitter two years ago, you would be looked at as someone who's very successful in the space. It really means nothing, but that's what it took. But I think a lot of people who have that type of validation, like that's what they thought made them successful, will start seeing other players in the space become successful on a whole nother level and be like, shit, am I you know, missing out on some, some of this success because I'm looking at things the wrong way? And I only cared about you know, the follower numbers or this or that. And um, there's a lot of other, you know, like we said, there's tons of different value props that you could bring to your life that you might value over over other things. But I think it's going to be very interesting because everyone is so friendly. But when money starts flying around, I think things can get a little more cutthroat. And I think that's what we're probably going to see over the next few years. Yeah. And I think, I think part of it too is, you know, is this a full-time endeavor for somebody? Is this amused? Are you there to be an authority? Are you there to be for notoriety? Are you there to build a business? That's what you said with the value props. You know, what are you there for? What is the, what is the purpose behind what you're doing? Because a lot of the people that were revered and rightfully so in the space for many many years you know it wasn't about dollars and cents right necessarily it was about you know maybe it's maybe they just love uh, analytics or they loved writing about it or they loved the space or the community or the fs uh, ta at the time so um yeah we'll, we'll see we'll see what happens it'll be very interesting with the sports betting angles coming into the space yeah, it's going to be fun to watch. Now, I, I talked about how you guys have had so much success via podcasting. I'm a YouTube guy, but you guys have had no lack of success on the YouTube platform either. Uh, I mean, you guys are, I think, hovering around 185,000 subscribers, closing in on 200K. So you already have the silver plaque from YouTube. I wanted to kind of get inside your head on how serious you guys take the video side of things. Because obviously, if anyone in the audience wants to go rewatch our first interview that we did, it's on the playlist on my YouTube channel. You could probably just search Andy's name and it'll pop up. You talked about when you guys started, you know, right off the bat, you were like, we want to make sure our production value is there. And like from the start, you didn't want to start with a bunch of like crappy equipment. Obviously, you guys have upgraded and things have gotten better over the years, just learning different things. Uh, but I mean, your video setup right now is very good. It's made for YouTube. And as I've started to grow on the platform, you know, I have uh, different people in the industry kind of reach out to me and just ask like, you know, how, how have you had success on YouTube? Like, what am I doing wrong? And 99% of the time, right away, I, without even having to look at their YouTube channel, I know they're not making videos. That's, that's the problem, right? Like YouTube is a video platform, but y'all are not making videos for it. You guys have done a good job of, you know, being very technically sound with the podcasting, but also the video stuff is fantastic. So I'm wondering, how do you view video compared to the podcasting? Because you guys are, are podcasters at heart, but your videos do numbers, your subscriber counts on there grow dramatically. And it's obviously a very important piece of the business because I think video gives you a, a piece of brand equity and a piece of loyalty from the audience that you can't get elsewhere. So I kind of want to just pick your brain on, on your thoughts behind video. And if you guys have been slowly moving towards making that more important in your business. Yeah, those are good questions. And I think there are some of those questions we don't have, you know, complete answers to in regards to, you know, we're, we're asking them to ourselves. 
in terms of how do we how do we adapt and extend kind of the video the video content? Is that you or me, huh? Is that, that me? Was, I'm a very popular uh, man. Oh, I freaked out for a second. But we, you know, we're looking at the channel and we're saying, okay, how do we, we, we had to make a lot of decisions on it for a long period of time. And a lot of them came out of the mindset of our primary goal is distribution of the long form content. That was a decision we had to make from the very beginning and have had to make it like three or three more times over the course of uh, the last several years. Because for us, the way that we focus on our advertising relationships, the way we focus on our year long deals, things like that, we're looking at the entirety of the show, the product, the 40 to an hour, 40 minutes to an hour show as its own piece. And so when we distribute in full length on YouTube, those numbers are factored into the way that, you know, we, we connect with advertisers. So, you know, in the very beginning it was like, okay, well, I know that YouTube's really not a place made for 40 to 40 minute videos to an hour. Those, those things aren't lost on us, but we've chosen to release it in that form because we believe that, that this was a show and a product that in its totality is how we wanted it consumed. Now we, since, since then we've, we've, you know, I think once or twice an episode, we'll pull out some highlights. We got a highlight playlist that lets us do some things um, distribution wise where we can connect with partners, give them highlights of the show. And that can, like you said, extend the brand and awareness. But uh, for us, a lot of the decision-making has been like, Hey, you're going to consume this entire show. Now, obviously on YouTube, people are going to dip in and out of the show, but um, we wanted to distribute it that way and be consistent with it. And so now it's more of a question of how much, extra content do we provide how much do we spend time developing three or four or five kind of outside the realm of our regular show videos during the course of the off season um whether that's more behind the scenes or scripted stuff like those are questions we're asking mm -hmm. but it's just a matter of like resource allocation and and like you said from the first interview we ha we did make the decision really really early when it was not financially beneficial to us in any way to commit to video and i think that paid off in, in, in time because we had, you know, we've been able to build the channel at a time when obviously getting 5,000 or, you know, a thousand views on a, a video version of the show when we had a hundred thousand on the audio, you know, it's not doing much for your numbers there. We're not monetizing it very much on YouTube, but it was just kind of committing to that piece of the puzzle as uh, more consumption on YouTube for fantasy content was going to grow over time. So um, we still view it in the lens of how does it extend our reach in terms of like the totality of the show and the podcast, but we are asking those creative questions of now that we have, you know, more resources or, or, uh, people available to us where it's like, Hey, do we, do we start to extend this a little bit more? Yeah. And I think we I mean, want people to connect with personality. We want them to, like you said, like on YouTube is different because you do connect with personality on a completely different level. And, uh, how can we use that for discovery? you know, on the platform. I mean, YouTube is, it's so important for growing your audience because discovery, organic discovery on YouTube is, it's been like this like two or three years now. It's, it's exponential. It's crazy. Yeah. And it, I mean, the, the gap is closing and it's not, I'm not surprised by this at all because so many people are popping up with channels. And I think a lot of it goes back to what you said about, you know, being able to use some of the highlight clips elsewhere because the way social media is now, the more popular platforms are very much video focused. So you make this YouTube video and you could take a clip and you could put it on Twitter, on Instagram, on LinkedIn, mm -hmm. on TikTok, if you want to, like all of those platforms revolve around visual, right? And I mean, you could throw an audio clip up somewhere, but it's not going to be anywhere near as, as powerful as, um, as video. So we are seeing a lot more brands and companies and just individual creators start to shift their focus more towards, um, towards video, but yeah, like the YouTube or, I mean, people, uh, another, another thing is people ask for help on YouTube. A lot of them don't recognize that like Google owns YouTube. Thus YouTube is simply a search platform. So when you're making these incredibly detailed titles, you're putting more work in than you need to be doing. It needs to be very simple. And that's the reason why it's, it's simple to grow on YouTube because you just kind of reverse engineer, um, whatever the audience is, is looking for. Um, right, right. Yeah, you know what I mean. It, it, it's a lot more simple than I think people people realize. Obviously, the content but, but, is pretty good, but but let, let's focus on one thing for a second there. Sure. The way that you're thinking about things for your business, the way that you're talking about YouTube, the way that you're thinking about the fantasy football industry is alien to a lot of people in the industry. 
that's the competitive advantage that you have that I think we've been able to manifest. That is a, we came into this space, you know, I was a web developer since I was 17 years old. We came in as game developers for eight years, a, a company that Jason ran. We came in as marketers and you're talking about marketing. You're talking about I love discovery. I love it. Yeah, of course. That's the most fun thing to do. And the thought processes that you had right there, when you talked about discovery, when you talked about your titles, when you talked about SEO, those don't happen if your mind is just, you know, writing articles about a player over and over again and not looking at the space as a business. You're not, that's something that happens when you're sitting down for uh, an hour of unplanned time and saying, boy, we don't really think of YouTube as a search engine. We think of it as a video platform, but we don't think about it as a search engine. How do we attack that? We don't think about those type of things. So yeah, I think that that's the, the intangible thing that people don't recognize where I enjoy that part of the business. That's what gives me, you know, joy in, in coming to work every day is part, part of it is running the business is the fun part of the business, right? It's not the case for everybody. Some people don't want to run the business. It's one of the things that's been a, a personal challenge for me with having, you know, a manager and an agent. It's like, you, if you're a band, take that off my plate, right? If you're a band, take all the administration off my plate. Don't run, go sign the deals, go do that stuff. But for me as an entrepreneur, I'm like, I've learned to let go of the grip a little bit, but it's like, I like that stuff so much. Why are you taking my favorite parts of the business away? Yeah. So that, that's been one of the personal challenges for me. Now, you know, we, it's been one that we've worked through in a really good way and we have really good people, but I still, I still love that part of it. It's, it's marketing. Like you said, it's thinking about things in this industry, maybe the way other industries think about things and then appropriating them here that nobody's ever done. And so, you know, I, I don't know exactly why or what intangible aspect your channel and your personality impressed upon me when I was first introduced to it. Like from a branding messaging standpoint, we're not like the same brand or anything like that. And, you know, you're, uh, you call me your uncle sometimes because <laughs> oh. we're, you know, we're just speaking to a different audience sometimes. And, mm -hmm. but there was some, there's some intangible to the way that you present yourself that, you know, I would tell the guys around here that I go, you know, I'm not exactly sure why, but I think that this guy's doing something special here. Now, I probably at the time, I'm probably like, yeah, I'm not even going to subscribe to this. <laughs> I'm not even going to like, I'm not even I probably wasn't even on Instagram at the time or anything like that. But I was like, man, there's just something a little bit different about the way he approaches. It, and I like that, you know, and I don't even know if they got it right away, but they do now. And and that's just a compliment to the way that you think and the way that you view the business and your hustle and all of those things. But it's hard to find people that talk about the space that way is, is basically my point. That's something I've, I've, that's something I knew even when we talked about it two years ago, when I was not anywhere near this, the size that my, uh, that, that the brand has kind of come into now. I didn't, I don't think I really realized how alien that thought process was until I was at like the FSGA and I was kind of, you know, mingling around and, and realize that a lot of people are really just grinding out the articles and doing that kind of stuff and, and don't have this bigger picture of what's available to us in the, in this space and um, thinking about it from a market. I mean, that's why we have the series. Cause I like, I want other people to start looking at it this way. And I think there's a lot of good insight to be had from people like yourself that have done it and been successful in it. And I think people from the outside need to hear it from, from, someone's <laughs> mouth like yours because you could hear it from me and I, if I was looking at me I'd be like this kid's full of shit but when we hear it from someone like you who has had the success you've had it inspires people and it motivates people to start thinking a little bit differently and thinking outside the box and I think what you guys have done is has gone completely in the right direction and definitely inspires and motivates a lot of people to start looking at things from from outside the box and I want to touch back on the the video versus podcasting thing real quick as someone who focuses primarily on video what we do completely, I, and I think another reason that maybe you kind of resonated towards what I was doing, if I had to put it in words, it would literally be like transparency and vulnerability. Like, I think that is the most important thing you could do with branding yourself. And I think a lot of people in the industry try to, it's like, they'll turn the, the transparency level up a little bit, but only to like a two and a half and three, they'll be like, Oh, this is what I like outside my work. But it's like, 
that's not it. Like you need more to really separate yourself and connect with humans. You know what I mean? So I, I would say, well, I think especially on your platform that you've, you've grown on too. I mean, YouTube in, I think maybe more than any other platform that is something that, you know, how long does it take for somebody to recognize transparency? It's not long. We're yeah. as human beings, we can see that really, really quickly. And a fear of it can be something that definitely hinders connection, right? You're not going to connect with people if you, if you are pretending you're something you're not. I just think that's another piece of this that that's kind of missing within the industry. On YouTube, right? Like everything is, is out there. It is transparent. You could see how many subscribers someone has. You could see how many views people get on, on individual videos. And you can get a good idea of how successful something is, whether it's a campaign or a series or whatever. Now I'm someone, I, I we literally take the video files, we strip it to an audio file and upload it via podcast. So I don't even, I look at my podcast numbers, maybe like three times a year. That's like not a driving force for me at all. So I'm curious, I'm curious as, um, as, as a brand that has been so successful via like the podcasting platforms, what kind of numbers do you guys see from like a podcast download standpoint? Because I think during the summer, say maybe like July through August, we'll start seeing anywhere between like 20 and maybe 50,000 views on, on videos pretty regularly when it gets very, very popular, the most engaging time of the year. I'm just like personally curious what download numbers look like for podcasts in our space. Yeah, I mean, our, our show, the podcast, we are, that's the core business of what we right. do. So it's all been focused around that. But like during, we're in a seasonal business, but during August, September, we'll, we'll peak out. We'll do shows that are 450 to 500,000 downloads an episode Okay, on the podcasting side. So, and I, I, am at, I don't have my YouTube numbers right in front of me, but I would guess that some of our bigger shows around August, September are probably 80 to 100,000. If one really hits, we'll probably, I, I would guess we average maybe 50,000 or something like that during that time 50 to 60 so yeah i mean it, it varies a lot with the seasonality but we do the majority of our work through the podcast okay yeah i was just curious on the numbers now you you talk about being you know seasonal and it's because you guys you know you always go back to having connection within fantasy football right and that's why you guys for the most part stick to season long stuff to redraft stuff you mix in dfs and dynasty throughout but the core of your product is season long stuff and i think that's because when you're playing season long you're playing with other people in a league, usually your friends or family, coworkers, whatever, and there's a connection there, and that goes back to the core of what your guys' business is. Seasonal businesses, seasonal <laughs> industries can be very difficult to to maneuver around because you know money doesn't drive you guys, but it needs to be a part of what you're but doing. But it still is what pays the bills. <laughs> yeah. Since this is releasing on Monday, you guys obviously put together your ultimate draft kit every season. Now it's getting, you know, closer and closer to Super Bowl. You guys launched it. The pre-order launched on Super Bowl Sunday. So it's out now. I believe it's on ultimatedraftkit.com. Yeah, you got it. Ultimatedraftkit.com. It's one of the very few resources I personally purchase each summer. So if you're out there in the audience and you're looking for a good redraft guide, go check out ultimatedraftkit.com. You can get it for a very good discount pre-order price right now. It is available. I wanted to dive into your head on the reason you guys launch it now because obviously you can't use this product practically until july or June. august yeah, yeah yeah and as i've navigated through the year over year kind of like business sense of our, of our industry i'm i'm starting to realize why you guys do it earlier at least from <laughs> from my perspective it's like yeah wow. you're right already Money, yeah, money now, <laughs> money now, even if it's less than what you're projecting, it's, it's, it's almost like I look at it like college players coming out. You we know it's coming. You know it's coming. <laughs> we, can, we can project a lot of production, but I'll take the production right now, even if yeah. it's less than what you think it's going to be an imaginary level of production over fake production down the line. So is this like, what, what, is, what is your thinking behind having it launch all the way in Super Bowl, even though you can't even use it yet? Yeah. And, and um, that was one of the things I knew you, you were going to ask me and you already kind of deduced why that began. Now it's more habitual yeah. than anything else. But look, when, when we were starting this, we knew, you know, we were going to make money in August, September, October, you know, for the actual podcast, you know, for selling ads. And then, you know, you do an ad in September and you got a 90 day wait and then you get paid. And so the seasonality of the business was very difficult to navigate in the beginning. It's one of the reasons we were on Patreon. You know, if we started our business from scratch right now, we probably wouldn't be in the Patreon environment. We'd have maybe subscriptions on the site or something, but we started on Patreon as this way to bridge this, you know, take the seasonality aspect and turn it into a monthly revenue stream. And we also 
pre-sold the UDK early because we needed capital. We needed cash flow in February, March, April, May that we didn't have. You know, we weren't doing numbers on the podcast during those months, nor do we now. Like our podcast numbers are going to be proportional to the, in, you know, the interest in fantasy. So even though we're a season long show, we do two shows a week from, you know, from now until July. So that's for a reason. If there was demand for five a week, now we'd do them. But we just basically set it up as a way to, to drive revenue and cash flow. Uh, I also think that there's, there were some peripheral benefits that we've learned over that time. You know, we're a season long show and we're about building the relationship and the connection and you are in. I mean, if you, if you get that product now, you're in, you're in for the season. You're, you're making that commitment to, to having a great fantasy year, to having a lot of fun while you do it. And you're making that commitment in February or March or April, and you're just kind of in for the season. So um, yeah, I mean, you, you kind of knew the primary causation and now it's, you know, it's just kind of a tradition for us. Yeah. I've, I've, uh, I've kind of pushed up the release date on my guide as well. Year over <laughs> year, slightly learning from you guys, but I'll just, I, I've realized that right. Capital in hand is very important, especially in these yeah. awesome months. And even if you're selling it at a 50% discount, give me, you know, the $25 in hand right now over the person telling me that they're going to buy it at $50 six months down the road. <laughs> I, from a business standpoint, I really don't, Dude. I, I don't believe customers, you know, unless it's money in hand, it's not a personal thing at all. It's not like a vendetta against people. It's just what I've learned a lesson that I've learned over the years. Yeah. That's always the discussion with things like discounts and coupons and affiliates where you're like, boy, I, I, I'd be happy to take your money with a discount. Now, if I knew you weren't going to give it to me later at full price, but you never know, you just don't know. You don't, yeah. you can't, like you said, it's time kind of money, uh, time is money. Exactly. Exactly. Sticking with the draft guide, you guys release uh, an app version, a mobile app version of the draft guide last year for the first time. From my eyes, I would absolutely consider it a success. It was extremely aesthetic. It was, ex you know, it, it was well organized and it worked very, very, very well. Um, I'm, I'm assuming, I don't know how many like hiccups behind the scenes there were, if there were any problems, but you would overall consider it a success from your side, right? No question. Yeah, we would. And there were plenty of hiccups and plenty of deadlines and plenty of things that we had to accept their state for in the time being where, you know, in your head, you said the app is going to have this feature and that feature. And, you know, we had to kind of constrain that a little bit, but absolutely a success, something that uh, we knew we needed to do. We wanted to do it at the right time with the right lead time. And, you know, it's not, a, it was not an easy task to get that functioning in the way that it needed to, but um, now that we've got that framework there and we can build on it and continue to iterate and just like so many other parts of your business, you just keep trying to refine what you're doing and make it better. And, um, so that'll be there definitely this year too. That's very cool. Yeah. I, uh, it, it's something that I would like to integrate on my side as well. I just, I know that saying that is so <laughs> much easier than this is, oh, man. Process, I'm, I'm assuming. And I, I don't even really know where to begin, but that's a, that's a different conversation that we could probably yeah. On. For the audience out there, again, like if you want more of the background, I know we kind of just jumped into to the marketing side of things right away. But for more of a background on like the footballers come up and Andy himself personally, you can go watch the first interview. These guys came into the fantasy footballers as a company with a lot of tech background, whether it was audio, web developer, like you already mentioned. For the app, um, I'm I'm assuming that you guys or you personally we're definitely not the person that like put it together online right yeah no we have we have a full-time developer that that was pretty much his his whole task at hand for better part of a year in in really getting that to the place wow. where it needed to be and okay. um it was a decision we made to bring somebody in it was somebody that we trusted we knew we had worked with before so it was one of those things where you know i know a lot of companies out there are making decisions on in-house outsourcing all of those type of things we had been down so many roads where it was like we all knew in-house that we wanted to be able to roll our chair into the next room and refine something mm -hmm. just the difference of that kind of a development environment versus writing an email to some team in a remote location so that was the decision we made and um yeah it, it took quite a bit of time to get it developed in the right way and like you said there it, there are things that pop up and things you can't expect and we wanted to have the lead time to deliver. We didn't want to promise something as a pre-order and not deliver a good product when it released. So uh, we planned, we planned ahead. We, we probably would have loved to have it out, you know, the year prior, but ultimately everything we've tried to do 
when we have had the ability to do it is just come out when it's ready. I mean, you just said it took the better part of a year for him to really get this down concretely. So that pretty much solidifies my thoughts on that. It's going to be a much more difficult process that I didn't even, uh, you know, originally imagined. And, you know, you touched on hiring your own developer rather than going to say like an agency that could do it for you that has a team. And I think, I mean, there are pros and cons to, I think both sides of them, but for uh, sure, for sure. Yeah, I would err towards what you guys did. Because, I mean, I've worked in marketing agencies before. And there, of course, there are going to be smart people that work at those places. But like the communication levels for getting things done can be on such a delay. Because like you said, you have to, sh you have to send the email. And if you're sending it to like more of an entry level person, they might have to go to their manager before it gets back yeah. to you. And you know, that, that could just delay the process in a million different ways. So this web developer, you said that you knew him personally, like prior to tackling the job. Where did you find him? Yeah, no, he was uh, he was one of the the main developers when we were doing the gaming company. So okay. this was a guy that we got back in contact with and said, "Look, we're looking to finally hire a full time developer. You know, what's it going to take to get you in here?" Type of thing. So we had a working relationship with him and his uh, ability and expertise. So that was a big help for us. You know, every project can be evaluated on kind of the needs of that project when you're when you're talking about a development of a, of a product. So. With fantasy, it was one of those things where you run up against people's drafts, <laughs> and if right. something's wrong, we don't got the luxury of long email chains, and you know, you you could do that. I mean, and it obviously depends on what the product is, but we were we were really wanting to have somebody that we could that could be on a problem quickly. Yeah, it's cool that that came, I guess, so naturally. Like you had someone right within your network that you could. Um, yeah, it's hard, man. It's hard. It's very difficult. And I find myself as I have no one obviously that's working for me full time, but I'm starting to build a little bit of a team around me. And I found that pretty much everyone on the team that helps me out on any level of our brand is has come on extremely naturally. Um, it's been either my friends or people that have followed the channel for, you know, years and reach out like, you know, I want to do this for you, et cetera, et cetera. And I didn't put this in the show sheet and it's just kind of popping into my head right now. A few weeks ago, I believe it was PFF pro football focus opened up a position to work for them. And it was, uh, like a $35,000 salary job taking care of their social media. They got a lot of backlash for this. People were like, well, you expect someone to work that hard for that level of income or whatever. And to me, I say not props to PFF in, in a bad way, but that's the leverage you give yourself when you build a brand you know, successfully, because there are a lot of fanatical football fans, a lot of fanatical PFF fans that would gladly take the job. And then you have other you know, people who were like writers from 10 years ago, 20 years ago, jumping in the comments and saying things like, what you think someone should just be handed a job. And it's just like, you know, it's just like birds like <laughs> bring at each other. And just to touch on like more of a brand level thing, when, when you do build a foundation of like what you guys have done successfully, you have the leverage of, of having fans and, and people in your audience that you can kind of pick from and develop a relationship supernaturally. And I guess maybe where this is pivoting to is one of the things that I want to do this summer is I actually want to bring on two interns. And uh, sometimes when I bring that up in conversation to people like, oh, I have a great site that you could post it on or some Facebook intern groups that you could post it on. And I'm like, I don't want to do that. Like everything I want, I want to come naturally from people who already understand what our brand is doing. So yeah, yeah. the furthest I'll go is I'll post it on YouTube. I'll post it on my personal Instagram or the, the brand Instagram. And I want to I want to bring people on who understand because like there are certain levels to the job that anyone could do from a technical standpoint. And I could teach them to do that. But at the end of the day, I want people to uh, come onto the team that personify what, what the message that we're trying to push and understand like where we're coming from, from a personality standpoint, right? So I don't know if, if I have a question for you in terms of the, the natural fit onto your brand, but I guess, have you guys ever thought of bringing on interns? We have done, um, we did one intern okay. uh, that came about organically, like you said. Uh, it's been brought up multiple times as like something that, I guess that's not true. I guess we technically did did a couple we had one in our first year for a little while they came organically out of like local university situations and or people that were just hugely passionate about the brand and the channel and things right. like that i mean what what you're saying when you're trying to craft a business that has so much uh you know vision or personality to it like it's just really really hard to teach somebody that doesn't just get it right so you know, when it comes to anybody that we've worked with and anybody we brought on board, anybody that's part of our part-time staff, those have always been people that just, 
they just got the brand and then it just organically grew over time. They, they understood what we represented in the space. And that's just such an, a help because, you know, it's a, it can become a, bur you know, we could bring five interns in, but am I training five interns on who we are? Am I training five interns on fantasy? Am I training them on how, you know, it, it's that whole situation where what benefit are you getting out of taking that leap? So we did have somebody that came in who, who literally, uh, shout out to Josh, he, uh, he moved out here for a whole uh, like six month period of time, did this internship as a semester of school, lived out here and um, hustled for us and, and, and went back home. But, uh, and it worked out well in that situation. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting, I guess, place of, of a business, especially when you're, when you're kind of starting out. And um, I feel fortunate that like, I think when I post about it, I'll be able to get a pretty good group of people that I think would, would yeah. really want to help out. And I, you know, I, I think it's just, it, it's just so important for, for businesses or brands out there to make sure that you have the foundation and build it correctly. It's going to take a very long time, but it's like the, it's the only way to do it in, in my opinion. And I, yeah, I would want to add one thing too, is we talked quite a bit about like us adding the developer to build out the app, but there, we also had years of choosing not to add a developer. And we also have had years of using contract work for different pieces of uh, needs around the company. And we've had times like even this last off season, I was pretty sure I was going to hire somebody to come on and be another, you know, full-time developer. And when I went through the motions of kind of writing up what I wanted in a person, I realized I was writing the job description of like two different people. And it was not, I was not going to find this unicorn type of situation. Yeah. And so we, you know, we made the decision like, I'm not going to try to bring somebody in and fit them into two uncomfortable situations, you know, uh, job disciplines. And we weren't going to hire two people. So we just, we tabled that and said, Hey, we're going to go, go the contract route for some of these needs as they come up. And I think that was the right decision in that case. So it's kind of, like you said, there are pros and cons to that. We, we definitely take hiring very, very seriously. I mean, from the experience of the old business that we had, as well as like, like we're not hiring somebody, at least here where we're like, okay, uh, this might not work out in three to six months, you're gone. Like we're, we're taking the long view of anybody we bring on in terms of, you know, how they're provided for insurance and retirement and these type of things. We're thinking about a lifetime commitment to a person. So we've been very careful about our hir hiring decisions to be both the right time, but also the personality fit um, of the people here in the office. We need that to be just second nature or we're going to disrupt the uh, the whole kit and caboodle yeah that that's going to be probably the most interesting part of of when i go through the the interview process for interns because i think my top priority would literally be like is this someone i want to hang out with is this someone that could you know handle because they're going to be coming into manhattan a couple times a week and like are, are they going to be able to you know hang with us as from from a lifestyle standpoint and i would almost put that over any of the work that i actually need them to do because we could teach them that kind of stuff so um it's interesting i'm really looking forward to it. it's going to be fun now yeah. when you're talking about like hiring obviously that's a, that's a huge monetary investment for you guys on top of the equipment and the studio and other things that you have going on I'm curious as to your investment into any sort of paid advertising, because organically you guys grow, you know, year over year to a very high degree. And I think that's probably the nature of our industry, um, especially when you're in a position like yourself where you guys have a lot of leverage, you're organically going to grow a lot. But there are also great opportunities to use paid advertising because some places are underpriced right now. I'm curious if you guys have ever dabbled with any paid advertising, whether it was, you know, wh whatever platforms it was or, you know, maybe TV or something. Um, so I'll kind of just give you the mic there and we can go from there. Yeah, we, d we definitely didn't do, I think, any uh, for the first maybe three years that we did the business. Couldn't afford it. Didn't think it was a good ROI. <clears throat> Looked at everything in terms of podcast listenership. And you're not going to really pay for one-to-one -one podcast listenership at that time. Right. You know, uh, so we didn't do a lot in the first three years. We do a little bit now, a little bit on the product front in terms of like some, some Facebook, Instagram stuff. And then uh, we've dabbled in a little bit of, you know, like mid-roll advertising at like peak times of the year. Right. Uh, just because we have some relationships in the podcasting space with different providers where we're like, hey, you know. I think last year we tried like a couple, you know, mid roll things in the middle of August. Uh, the hard part about anything from an organic growth perspective is like, you're not, 
if you're not advertising a product, you're not tracking, you know, you, you know, so it's intent, you know, it's, it's almost immeasurable. You can't really go in and look at it and, you know, we're able to make some decisions now where we're like, okay, this is branding focused. You know, obviously like the tour is really, the tour is not about ROI. No, of course not. <laughs> the tour is about, you know, the brand and it's about fan service and it's about the profile a little bit, it, you know, so you make it, the, the tour was a marketing expenditure choice uh, for the company. And I think we've made some of those choices with some little advertising here and there, but and not very extensive. My question, my follow-up question would have been like, was, was your marketing efforts, you know, if you did it on Facebook or Instagram geared towards awareness or geared towards a paid product. But I think uh, it's interesting because, you know, the ultimate draft kit, I'm sure it does very well. And that's, you know, a very concrete product that you could advertise. And what I would think would be a, a pretty good plan for that, if you wanted to funnel a little bit of money into it, would just be straight remarketing to people that yeah, have- Yeah, and that's what we do. Yeah, I, I figured it's it's like it's almost like not worth putting money out into awareness of the draft kit because anyone that could find you organically, yep. remarket to them, and I'm sure the ROI would be like eight to ten x on Instagram or Facebook ads. So anyone that's even seen your personal profile or your the brand profile or whatever you yep. want. Well, that's exactly right. Is the the kind of we we have kind of taken our marketing mindset in the place where we like people in our funnel, so to speak, you know, in our universe and then organically out of that universe, creating a connection to the show that comes products, sales or Patreon that comes, you know, whatever peripheral revenue sources. Ultimately we're just building that kind of relationship on the free product. We do some UDK advertising to the degree that you're mentioning, but, um, but we, I don't think we've really seen ROI on anything that's been, you know, blind awareness, non-retargeting awareness, stuff like that. Yeah. It also feels so, so weird targeting people for awareness on just like your show. It's just like, if they're not coming yeah. organically, it's like, I, it's like, I don't even want them. You know what I mean? You don't have a habit already of wherever, like when they come organically, they have a habit of like, free, you know, they're on YouTube, they're, they're on the podcast app. And then you're into a routine, which is the kind of relationship we want, as opposed to like clicking a banner ad and okay, you came to our website. Do you even know what a podcast is? I mean, I think the last time I checked, it was like 35% of America regularly uses podcasts or whatever the case may be. So that's the challenge on anything. Even if you go like the big market, like, man, a TV ad would be really great on August 25th during the fourth preseason game or something like that. It's like, well, how much education do I want to pay for yeah. <laughs> for, the, uh, for the end user? Do I want to pay for them to learn what a podcast is? Do I want to pay for them to, to understand what the heck I'm talking about? And I don't ultimately if they like to the show they're going to they're going to stick around so we we've stuck to most organic on the podcast okay so we've talked a lot about the successes that you guys have had uh as a brand i want to dive into a few maybe like random questions that i think would uh maybe get the audience to know you a little better or know the brand a little better if you could choose one area of what you guys have done as as a company where you think you might be lacking, where do you think it, it would be? And maybe why do you think that that is the case? Yeah, I mean, don't consider me laboring for answers to be thinking we have it all together. We certainly don't. Um, and I think there's a lot of areas. I'm most sensitive to the areas that I consider, like the web. Like the web is one of the areas where I'm like constantly for five years, feeling like we're not taking advantage of like there are entire fantasy football companies that exist solely on the web, no podcasts, no YouTube mm -hmm. that generate great income and are great resources. I mean, I think we look at it and say, I wish we had more tools. I wish we had a more robust site player profiles. These are all things that are like roadmap items for us, but I always feel like we're just never able to turn the dial or, you know, they're so low on the value proposition right now for how we're broken down that, that it, I feel like we are falling short at, like I want to keep improving those aspects. We have kind of a, a crappy account system, you know, with like our site and our Patreon and all this integration that's too confusing. Like that I would never hard, do man. this. That, that stuff's really it's hard. Oh, integrating multiple systems. And it's like, if I could, if I could just say, give me six months to build it from the ground up, but like nothing screws up our existing systems. Like, like don't talk to me. Let me just work on yeah, this I, for I, six I, months. Yeah. So th that's an area where I, I'm so thankful that our listeners endure that. I'm like, I don't, you know, it seems annoying as heck to me and I wish I could fix it tomorrow. 
so I guess to that end, like we, we will eventually, but it's not now. And so um, making things easier on the listener, on the, on the fan is at the top of our list. I think. That's an extremely underrated part of, of like running a business is the things that customers take for granted. Like even, you know, when you personally purchase something or I do, you get the, the thank you page, the follow-up email, the 100%. Ship confirmation, the order, conf- like all of this stuff, it just seems so easy and automated. That shit is very difficult on the back end to, to know that you have it set up correctly. And especially if you're offering all these different kinds of products and services, it, it, it's a million different little parts doing it at once. So like if you get ahead of yourself and you want to do the product without having the right back end installed in the foundation of how you're going to communicate with the audience or the, the customers or whatever, like you put yourself in a world to hurt. Like you have to put the work in from the start to make sure you have the system in <laughs> you place. Are, you know, like you, you pick good timing for that. Cause I mean, with the UDK just launching yesterday, I redesigned the checkout page, you know, it's like we're going from a two page to a one page. It's like the amount of testing, the amount of like, you know, back of your mind fear when you have a successful product that you're trying to iterate on and improve these products. Well, it kind of worked. It's worked for a long time. Why are we changing something? Well, why le- you don't rest on your laurels, like finding that balance between the two. And uh, like you said, I think the silver lining there in all the intricacies of doing that stuff right is that there is an opportunity to do it better than somebody else uh, because it takes that much attention to detail and that much thought. And, you know, you opened up the thank you emails and the, the way that account interaction works, but you can go beyond that to email marketing and drip campaigns and, you know, interacting with people on a one-to-one basis, you know, like our patrons and, and being able to, when they leave, are you interacting with them? When they arrive, are you interacting with them and building those connections? Like, and, and then can you systematize it so that you are not putting a disproportionate amount of your effort on something that doesn't grow your business, but does help your business. So uh, that's kind of how my mindset always goes is it's like build something great and then systematize it in a way that makes it, you know, that's fun for me. I like doing that, but it's, it's hard work. Like you said, it takes time and, and, uh, you have to, you have to work at it. Yeah. I mean, there were like a couple small problems that I found last year with my system set up. And before you knew it, I was answering like dozens and dozens of, of customer emails like daily about this problem. I'm just like, I don't know how to fix it. So until (laughs) next summer, I'm just going to personally answer every one of these emails. I'm like, I'm like, that can't, I can't ever do that again. You know? So it's like those kind of things need to be done up front. And as you grow, like you're scaling, you know, you're growing and it's like they get exacerbated. Yeah. Like for sure. And our, our customer support, um, guy that comes in for a few hours to handle that stuff during that time of year, it's like, if I take that one link away or take that one little FAQ button away, it's like the difference is night and day on how people understand things. So putting yourself in their shoes, testing things. If something sucks, but you tell people that you're, and you mean it, like not just tell people, like if you, if something sucks, but they know you care about that it sucks and you are working on it, there's a lot of forgiveness 100%. In, in that world as opposed to disregarding it. Like, all of the shortfalls that I just talked about, the things that stick in the back of my head, like we're going to fix them. It'll take some time and it'll have to fall into line at the right place. But you know, those, those will get done. Very true. Yeah. Anytime I, I saw like a, a problem arise and I was getting a lot of emails about it, I would just send out an email to everyone that was like in that space. I'd be like, I love you guys. I'm really sorry. I'm the worst, but I'm working on this. And they would all be like, it's okay, Nick. Like, don't worry. But it's, it's There's it's, that transparency a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Know? Exactly. The face that- to the product. Yeah, exactly. And that's why, I mean, it, it's it's such a small thing that you don't realize, but it can be so uh, impactful. Um, and, and it's funny that like you think the things that you lack are, I guess, more on the technical side, like you want more tools and projections and et cetera, et cetera. And I've told you this before, I think in person, like I, I think, and this is probably just like a personally coming from where I, I come from, uh, from a creative side, like I think you guys need to be vlogging more. And maybe this is a millennial. Yeah. No, no, no. That's, that's on the list too. More behind the scenes, more, more video content. It takes more effort, man. Oh, you know better than anybody on this planet. Cause you, you do this. It takes so much effort to do that stuff. Like we'll, we'll commit before the season to doing like our water bet videos. Yeah. You know, it's like we did them for three weeks. And well, that's, then it's that's like, why I'm like, that's why I'm almost like you guys, you know, I'm, I'm not going to tell you like how to hire someone, but like a position you guys should think about is literally just a yeah. videographer, like a, a behind the yeah. scenes 
videographer. I couldn't believe that you guys didn't have one following you around for the for the tour that you did around the country. Like that is that would have been like the coolest. Obviously, you guys posted a lot of clips and like did a lot of stuff constantly. Yeah. But like a dedicated person to just be doing that is something so cool. So when I think of not something necessarily that you're lacking, but an opportunity that you could definitely like capitalize on and build a stronger brand loyalty with the people that are already on board with you is showing more. And I'm, I was like looking at some of the videos. Like you guys did a a, a studio tour right of of your place in yeah. Arizona on YouTube. It was like a four minute video, and it did well in terms of like numbers and stuff. But like that, that kind of stuff is, it like takes your relationship with the audience to like an exponential level, you know? It's definitely, um, when you talk about things that we look at and we say that we're falling short at, that's, that's definitely on the list is okay. being able to appropriate that time. I think sometimes we get, you know, when you said looking at last year, you know, the tour and how much time it fills up. We also, during the entirety of the regular season, we were doing eight shows a week and that included like a two hour Sirius XM live show we would sometimes just get to that place where it's like you put so much into those other pieces that we were just didn't want to do more you know you just you just don't want to do more things so uh, a little bit of a sanity thing there but again that's where you could build it could be people that help with that and it can be systems to make it not as burdensome you know that 80 20 rule of like you know get a lot of effect out of a little bit of effort systematize it a little bit you know just commit to it a little bit because, uh, you know, obviously like flipping on the phone and doing a an Instagram video can take no time at all. If you yeah. are thinking, if you're thinking that way, if your mindset is in, is in that connection. Yeah. And you know, the in season, you guys, you were doing eight shows a week or whatever. For the record, I like my least favorite part of anything we do <laughs> is the in season content. And we talked about <laughs> this in Vegas, actually, we talked about the burnout. Um, yeah. Because I mean, the off season, like this time is so much fun for me because I get to do, I get to put out pieces of content like this. It's, these are conversations that I love having, right? When you're in season, it's not that I don't like doing that content, but you're on such a strict time schedule where it's like, okay, Sunday games happen. You need to have your waiver wire stuff out by like Monday, Tuesday, the latest, because everything happens Wednesday. And it's like a much longer process than people realize. And then as soon as the waiver wire is out, it's like, we got to do the trade targets video. We got to do this video. We got to do that <laughs> video. And it's like, yo, that's yeah. so much work. And it burns you out really, really quickly. And you would ask me, you're like, how, you know, how early in the season did you get burned out? And I was like, honestly, <laughs> by like week three or four, like that's how I really felt. So my question back to you is like doing that many shows, you have to get burned out. And, and it's, 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 it's a scary feeling because looking at it from where we sit, it's, we get to do a job that's awesome, right? It's yeah, 100%. So, much, so much fun and so grateful. But then when something like that, when you get the mindset shift where you're like, oh, I'm burnt out, I don't want to do this anymore. You're like, damn, if I don't want to do something that I'm passionate about, like, where do I turn from here? So this summer for me, especially this off season, I'm going to be focusing way more on like quality than quantity just for the sake of doing quantity. I want to do things that I enjoy uh, more than just to see numbers grow or to see revenue or things like that. So my question, I guess, to you is like, you know, like how real is the burnout for you? How do you deal with it? Do you have any tips, whether it's like physically or mentally? And, you know, it, I mean, it's got to, it's got to affect you in, in some capacity, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a, uh, <laughs> you brought it up. It's a, it's a weird thing to be like, don't hear what I'm not saying about complaining about doing right. a job that no one on earth gets to do. Like, it's not, it's not so much complaining. It's just like you said, it's management. It's, it's figuring out how to maintain the passion for something that you love and that you cannot do that with blind routine. You have to do that with evaluation. You have to do that with stepping back. You have to do that with making, you know, one of the, the things that is so incredible about the people I work with here specifically Mike and Jason, but also our producers and our team, is that we fill in the gap for one another when, when you hit that wall. You know, we have, there's three of us. When one of us has got, we're sick or we're not ourselves that day or our kids are sick or we were up with them all night, like maybe one of us isn't on that one day. But we don't have to feel the level of pressure that we might feel if we didn't have each other to lean on for those situations. Uh, or just, Jason, just take this day off because you got something going on. Like, that is one piece of the puzzle that has been really, really helpful, that I'm thankful for, that I don't take for granted. When we shifted from being the guys that literally wrote every word on every show doc, edited every video, edited every podcast, put them up, to having, getting to share some of that load with, you know, Brooks and Kyle and 
you know, Kyle's a guy who does research for some of the shows for us, you know, like we'll put the doc together, but he'll just look at it the night before he's on the East coast. He, before we record, if there's something that he thinks needs to be in there, having those little pieces takes a little bit of that pressure off and then evaluating at the end of the year and saying, what steps can I take to make it that I'm the job I'm doing is something I enjoy doing as often as, you know, we do it. So that's our goal, you know, and, and you're going to, you're not gonna be perfect at something like that and that's part of the hustle and diligence and fighting through it and showing up and you know working through the burnout and maybe not even letting people see it you know some of that is just professionalism and diligence but in terms of the intrinsic am I going to love what I'm doing and is that going to keep coming through you have to take those steps to say we're going to cut this piece out this piece is good this is a good piece of our business we're going to cut the good piece out that's the hardest decision for a business owner you, you're afraid. You can be afraid of losing a good thing. But is it at the expense of a great thing? Do you want something to be great in your business or do you want a bunch of good things? And that's the kind of thing that I think we stare down all the time where, um, <laughs> you know, whether it's, uh, you know, we could make tons more money if we allowed a bunch more people into our priority questions tier on Patreon and answer more questions, like lots more money. Do we want, do we want more money? Do we want to enjoy what we're doing? You know, those are the decisions that, that you have to make. So yeah, the burnout was more real this past year than it ever had been before, because uh, I think, I think part of it was the tour and we had some hiccups and travel with the tour. We got like stranded in some places and we, you know, so the trips were longer. And so we, we just got bounced around a little bit and had that stuff pop up. But, you know, each year we're, we're looking at the decisions that we're making and saying, does this fit into the puzzle of remember why you do this? You know, because if it's not something that fits that, I don't care if it makes me an extra few dollars. Yep. When we, when we were sitting down in a, a meeting the other day, I asked the guys, you know, I said, you know, if you kept the schedule exactly the same as we did last year and the company grew 30 percent or we modified it in X, you know, this other way and we, we made the same amount of money what what would you choose do people ever sit down and ask that question about their business or do they just aspire to numbers because that's what people do that's the whole thing is is do you do what you do because people tell you that's what you're supposed to do or do you sit down and say you know for me i'm looking at it and i'm going what do i want the next five to ten years to be what do i want to be as a father and a husband for the next five to ten years because my kids are the five eight and eleven so the next five to 10 years that I got, 10 to 15 years, that's when they're in my home. So those are the things that I'm looking through. That's the lens I'm looking through. And I, and I realized I'm privileged at this point to, to get to look at it that objectively with the leverage that we have and with like income and having. So I don't take that for granted. And I do not for a minute indict anybody that has to put stresses on some of those areas of their life as they build the ability to provide for their family but you still have to realize what you're sacrificing. Cause like you said, you have a certain amount of time in every day to be the person you want to be, to be the businessman you want to be, to have the creative outlet, to do all those things. And I don't fault anybody. We don't have all the answers at our business and every rule that we follow doesn't apply to every business, but this is the way we run our business and we believe in it. So, you know, that, that works for us. And we're going to evaluate success by that mission and not by the mission of the world basically. Yeah, super, super powerful answer. Uh, I couldn't agree more. And like I said, that was that was the biggest issue for me this year was was the burnout and being able to step back and be like, this is why I burnt out because I'm starting to push myself into what you said, like a blind routine. And part of that routine was doing things that I didn't enjoy. And it's like, yes, that could come with a, a, a positive result. But what is the other side of that spectrum? And is it worth sacrificing this something great for something good. And most of the time it's not. So when you find yourself like in that middle ground, uh, you really have to, you know, be objective about the situation, step out and look at it from a, from a bird's eye view and, and kind of plan what you want over the long run. I think uh, a lot of people make very, very poor short-term decisions based, right. on, you know, based on things that they, they wouldn't be doing that if they were looking at it from someone else's viewpoint, looking down on, on their lives probably. So um, it's just, yeah, that what a good reminder it is, like, if we saw somebody else, what, how would we speak into that life? You know what I mean? Yeah. We, we were, we're less introspective and we're more 
condemning it. We can see it's like relationships, right? It's like yeah. you see somebody in an unhealthy relationship. It's yeah. so clear to you, right? It's like everybody sees it. Everybody, but when you're in it, you don't see it as much. And um, you know, being receptive to maybe being receptive to the the good friends in your life and the criticism without overwhelming pride that you're doing everything right is a piece of the puzzle too. Because, um, you know, I'm type A. I'm a control kind of guy. I want to do things my way. I think I know it all and I don't. And I've learned for five straight years that I don't know everything, even though I think I do. And the times that I've been willing to shut my mouth and listen have generally been the most edifying times, not the ones where I take over the situation. Yeah. And I I think it it comes back to like what I hinted at before, just combining like your physical energy and your mental energy. It's like, a lot of the job is physical, right? Getting in, doing the research, doing the work, getting videotaped, but you have to consider that the mental side of things is at least 50%, if not like way higher than that. Cause I know like when I was burnt out and that stuff carries over into your physical life. And I, I, I would like have my friend, my, some of my best friends would be like, yo, are you good? Like, you, you know, you're being kind of a dick right now. And I wouldn't even realize it. And I was like, Oh my bad. I, I'm like super stressed with work. I'm just like not enjoying what I'm doing in the parts of my life that I should be in, enjoying this. And that right over to, to other things. So I can't really stress how, um, how important it is for, for people out there to, to take care of your men, mental health because yeah. the the you're inside your head 100% of the time. So that stuff is um, important to, to take care of. Now, you guys are super busy over there, obviously, and it seems like you don't have time for much, uh, much else to put on your plate. But I did want to ask you. Well, we got uh, time for foosball. We got foosball and shuffleboard. We got all the time in the world, just so you I, know. If you're ever out here. I'll come to the studio. And get and yeah. whooping. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go. We're, we're a little competitive. Uh, we can bring pickleball in there too. You probably never heard of it, but we'll bring that in. Listen, before I got, before I went out to Vegas, I was in Florida visiting my grandparents and my, <laughs> my grandpa is, a, he that is, sounds about right. He is an avid pickleball player. He's been playing. That makes it sense. Years now. I have no idea what it is to this day, <laughs> but you can't forget the name. Once you told me he's playing pickleball, that's something I'll never forget. What, what yeah, is Flo- Florida. Pickleball is like you're on a, a miniature tennis court and you're hitting around, you're hitting a wiffle ball with a wooden paddle. You can you can use that YouTube resource to, to look it up. Kind of a half ping pong, half tennis type of game for old people in Florida and Arizona. Sorry, <laughs> you, right, you well, had you had a real question, but we got distracted. I'm down. Hey, listen, that's a creative endeavor as well. Well, just from someone from my standpoint, I have uh, a lot of things that I like to do as anyone does, like outside of fantasy football. And I like to relay those into my work. And I like to make those outlets that I share and put those into pieces of content to share with other people out there. I, I'm curious as to if you personally see yourself, maybe it could be in the next year, the next five years, 10 years, 15 years, eventually. Do you have any other creative endeavors that you want to um, attack? Like for, for me, just as an example, like I love putting out the blogs. Um, I love talking sure. about business and marketing. And I, I could tell just, you know, just from talking to you and seeing when you guys do the, the Reddit stuff about business, like you guys are very passionate about that as well. I know you were working on this children's book. I remember when I, um, I was talking to my sister about it, you had posted about it on Twitter, but I just want to know, like outside of fantasy sports, outside of like, you know, just sports in general, are there things that you would like to attack personally, or maybe it's a, it's a trio of you guys. I know you do the spitballer. So comedy is definitely a right. creative outlet for you guys, but anything outside of that? Yeah. Spitballers is a wonderful, not football thing to do. <laughs> It's like, um, you know, like sitting down and, and there's no prep and we just have fun. Um, yeah, I think there are those things for sure. I mean, I, I like, um, you know, the, the children's book is something that I'm working on actively right now. That fits the, still the kind of message that our show has about kind of the inclusivity of sports in general. Like the idea that like this, is a, this can be a family family oriented thing, not something that's exclusionary of, of your kids or your, your wife or your husband, those type of things. So I'm, I'm excited about that. I, I would love to, writing is something that like I grew up doing. It's something I thought I would do back when I thought like newspapers were going to be around forever. Like I was a journalism major in, in college. That was my first, the, the first major that I, I headed towards back when I thought being a columnist was, was at the top of the possible sports list. Yeah. And so <laughs> You know, um, that would be a full circle thing for me is to continue writing in some capacity. You know, I have I have a passion for um, my faith and, and Christianity and, and 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 maybe writing to the degree of like how we how we balance the uh, our faith and business and priorities in life. And so that's something that I think someone can speak to 
you know, in, in, in a book or something at some point in time. So those are kind of like long-term things that sit in my head a little bit as creative outlets, as things that I'm passionate about. You know, ultimately right now, I'm really passionate about being a father and a husband, about being faithful to the opportunities that I got and, um, you know, just seeing where, where those things go. But yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I, if it's, if it's been lost in any of the ups and downs of the last hour and a half of talking about, you know, the things we have wrong with the business, I, I just want to stress just how thankful we are for the, the blessing that it's been to catch lightning in a bottle and have people connect to us. Like you don't, I can't sit down and like tell you why that that happened, you know, the way that it did you, you know, I, it, it just, feels kind of surreal after five years of doing it that we get to do it so just really thankful for the people that we have and thankful for the opportunity that we have and for all the listeners and fans that are you know it I mean they're just crazy supportive they they build these relationships and that was the one thing on the tour that's mind-blowing is it's like you you meet person after person that's like you're meeting them for the first time and they're like I've known you for four years yeah like you're on my you're 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 on my truck every morning for four years i know everything about you (laughs) and you're like and now i get to meet you and it's surreal so uh very thankful yeah i mean the the energy within those live shows is is crazy you could tell those people like they they live and die and breathe for you so funny man they're so funny it's still so surreal to see those videos it's like what are we talking about (laughs) we're talking about (laughs) fantasy fantasy football you know I mean, the, the cool thing about that is is having these other, and uh, I'm, I'm interested to learn about all the people that I'm going to bring on for this series, what their other creative outlets are, because when you put yourself in a position like you have, where, um, you know, you have influence and you have leverage, when you start to shift that towards whatever passions you have, they'll most likely be uh, a success. I mean, you see just influencers all over the place, like the guy on Instagram, I don't know if you follow any like meme accounts, but one of the first big meme account was this kid, Fuck Jerry. And now he has become like his own business in a sense. He has his own media company. He started his own uh, tequila, Jaja Tequila. Has nothing to do with what he was doing originally. But when you give yourself the leverage, like you create this following around yourself as a person. So people will believe in whatever direction you kind of pull them into. So it's cool. Like whenever you start doing that stuff, I'm sure you'll have uh, a ton of passionate people following you and, and believing in what you're doing as a person, you know? Yeah. It's, it's cool to, to have some of those opportunities because of the, the business and um, yeah, I look forward to endeavoring into those at some point in time when it makes sense. <laughs> yeah. I'm looking forward to it. Um, this was yeah. a, a phenomenal talk as, as I expected it to be. You bring so much good insight to people that are in the audience right now, whether they're in the industry or within a different industry, I'm sure they could take away uh, a ton from this. So if you enjoyed the talk, all I ask is that, you know, share it, share it with someone that you think that it might help or share it with people within in the, in the industry. If you think they'll enjoy it, make sure you're following Andy and, and the footballers all over the social media, which I will link down below. Make sure you check out their ultimate draft kit on ultimate draft which is available for pre-order right now. And uh, you could drop a comment down below. If you have anyone in the industry that you think would be uh, good for a conversation like this, because I, have a lot of slots to fill between now and I think I'm going to do this probably through the NFL draft or so so 12 or 14 episodes something like that should be a, a good run a good series and Andy I'm uh, forever in your debt for coming on once again and uh, giving me the the hour and a half to uh, sit here and talk with you and, and learn from you as a person all right it's always a lot of fun I really appreciate what you're doing and uh, who you are and um, it's been a lot of fun same from this side love you guys see you uh, I don't know Thursday Friday something like that Later. <laughs>